Right, so the anti-Semitism scam and Keir Starmer. We're back onto this again, but in a way the Starmer may not like too much. Now, if you, like myself, have been waiting for a moment of karma to come along and hit those in the Labour Party who have weaponised this issue, perhaps we don't have a lot longer to wait, as potential legal action, no less, may well be on the way. Yet more of it for Starmer's Labour to deal with. And given it has been such a scam, as many of us have repeatedly stood up and called it, and been called a fair few things by Starmer supporters in return, this will expose that matter for all to see. All forms of racism are horrific. They're intolerable. All of us surely agree on that. They should be all equally condemned. Yet in the Labour Party, that is not the case. Anti-Semitism, for example, has a bespoke complaints page on Labour's main website. But no other form of racism does. That's a problem to me. What do you think? When it comes to the issue of anti-Semitism, I, like many others, know that it was weaponized as a stick to beat Jeremy Corbyn with. They tried so many other things. This was what finally stuck. An absolute falsehood as it was. But the thing with lies, especially when they're so prominently in the public eye, is that people keep questioning. And the more they get questioned, the more the lie grows. A lie can travel the world before the truth has got its boots on, as they say, or something like that. But a lie has no basis beyond shallow personal gain for whoever is spreading it. And when people dig into it, the lie has to grow. New lies have to be told to keep it perpetuating. And in this case, more people have to be punished. This legal action, then, potential action, has come from Jewish Voice for Labour, a Labour-affiliated group set up in 2017 to support Jeremy Corbyn, who is a great friend to Jewish communities. A substantial community of Jewish people live in his constituency of North Islington, after all, and are very supportive of him. To be a member of the JVL, you have to be both Jewish and a Labour member. Other Labour members of a non-Jewish persuasion could join as solidarity members, supportive of the group's aims and values, which were to support the aims and ideals of the then left-wing Labour leader, as well as fight for the rights and say-so of left-wing Jewish members of the Labour Party. So when the Labour right, in all their various forms, moved against Corbyn on the basis of accusing him of allowing anti-Semitism to pervade in the party to propagate that lie, other members had to be sacrificed too. Investigations, finding people guilty of being anti-Semitic and not in keeping with Labour values. A clumsily worded tweet, perhaps. Liking a post by a MP from another party. Whatever it took to show that Corbyn had let too many anti-Semites in, for which you can read rotten lefties, frankly, who he enthused and inspired, into the party ranks and diluting its red Tory chosen direction of political travel by the narrow-minded, get-rich-quick, careerist types on the Labour right. Entire affiliate groups were sent packing as well, of course, retrospectively even, the crime of time travel being created essentially, as members were purged for attending meetings with groups before such groups were ever barred. A great many people from the JVL were barred for this reason too, sent packing from the party, mainly for attending meetings of the later prescribed group Labour Against the Witch Hunt, calling out the purely factional actions against its own membership who was being conducted under Keir Starmer's leadership, the witch hunt being the purges against people being accused of anti-Semitism, which was the narrative the mainstream media mainly carried too. The net result of this lie, of course, is that under the auspices of accusations of anti-Semitism, Jewish members of the Labour Party were accused of being anti-Semitic themselves. And of course, one leading reason why people were being found guilty of this hate crime against Jewish people was Labour members calling out the actions of Israel against the Palestinian people. This worked because for too many people, being Jewish and supporting the Israeli state is seen as being one and the same. But this is false. It is not anti-Semitic to call out Israeli atrocities, land grabs, home seizures, gunning down kids in the street, segregation. Israel is an apartheid state, and you're no racist for calling it thus. It is, however, anti-Zionist, but plenty of Jewish people are anti-Zionist against the state of Israel, but because of their conduct, not necessarily based on their mere existence. Plenty of non-Jews are Zionists themselves, such as Keir Starmer, without qualification. But conflating the two has become normalised, despite being wrong, and again raises cases of Jewish people being found falsely to be anti-Semitic themselves. Look at it this way. Under the Labour Party, you have Jewish people, for reasons outlined already and others, being accused of Jew hate themselves, of hating themselves in effect. Can you appreciate how that looks? How ridiculous that stands? How stupid that is? Self-hating Jews? Well, you've heard plenty in the media say that, but that makes it no less stupid, does it? Look at it another way. When was the last time you had a black person on the media accused of anti-black racism? When was the last time you saw a Muslim person decried for being Islamophobic? It hasn't happened because 
Where the Jewish faith and the Labour Party's conduct are concerned, it is all a lie. Well, the lie is being called out and the JVL are the ones doing it. A letter of complaint has been sent to General Secretary of the Labour Party, David Evans, and copy to the European Human Rights Commission, the EHRC, from law firm Bindman's, who are acting on behalf of Jewish Voice for Labour. This is a nine-page document setting out all sorts of compelling evidence of discrimination against Jews who have called out Israeli actions, defended Palestine, called out the deliberate confusion of the term Zionism and anti-Semitism, and how their members, the membership of the JPL, are being disproportionately targeted by the Labour Party. If proven in a court of law, if things get that far, that would be quite damning, wouldn't it? And the JVL are claiming to have all the receipts. According to their analysis, a Jewish member of the Labour Party is up to six times more likely to face investigation by the regime than a non-Jewish member. Upon being investigated, they are nine and a half times more likely to be expelled for anti-Semitism than non-Jewish members. Think about that for a second. If their numbers are right, and they must be pretty sure to be instructing solicitors, you're more likely, almost 10 times more likely to be expelled from labor for anti-Semitism for being Jewish than if you aren't. With regards to the JBL specifically, full members of the JBL are an astonishing 53 times more likely to be expelled. And if you're a JBL officer, it's a crazy 444 times more likely. They're left wing. Tell me it isn't factional with stats like that, and all to perpetuate a lie that has turned into a Pandora's box that Labour under Jeremy Corbyn became more anti-Semitic, a Pandora's box that Starmer's Labour can't put the lid back on. And so the lie has to keep growing. Perhaps a legal ruling is the only way this can truly be brought to a meaningful conclusion then. Perhaps exposing the lies, all lies do, the liars end up coming undone. We've seen what happened to Boris Johnson after all. And well, a lawyer like Keir Starmer should have plenty to worry about in that, in which case. Fundamentally, it all exposes the fact that by using anti-Semitism for political ends or factional reasons, Starmer's Labour do not care about Jews. Just how Jewishness can be used to their advantage. All they seem to care about is anti-Semitism and how that might be useful to them, rather than something to be truly flushed out as a societal evil that it is. Conducting themselves as they are, they are shutting down conversations about the plight of Palestine, as well as excusing the apartheid being conducted by the state of Israel. And when Jewish people do speak out about such things, that does confuse those listening as to why a Jewish person would do that, when previously all they're hearing is the Labour Party and the mainstream media narratives on this issue. That, I believe, is one of the biggest factors determining the heightened levels of suspension and expulsion seen amongst JVL members who are calling it out and frankly embarrassing the Labour Party who are wrestling with this Pandora's box that is getting more and more out of their control. A legal case might just finally derail it, and it needs to be derailed if the fight against anti-Semitism is ever actually going to get back to being a fight against the real thing. I wonder how David Evans will react to it. The EHRC. Has Starmer got reason to be worried about this, do you reckon? The crowdfunder for this has passed £130,000 already. They mean business here. Is it inevitable this will end up in court, do you reckon? What will that mean for Starmer and Co? Do let me know in the comments below. Have your say on this. Be part of the conversation. Meanwhile, there's a video recommendation where Keir Starmer brought a motion some months back, you might remember it, in order to block Jeremy Corbyn standing as a candidate for Labour going forwards. But given all the narratives and all the conversations and everything surrounding Jeremy Corbyn and all the accusations aimed at him, you might be surprised to know anti-Semitism wasn't part of that application, that motion whatsoever. Surely it's not all a lie and to bring it up would be libelous, Keith. Well, of course it would have been. Bolsters the case by the JVL all the more, I think. Best of luck to them on this. I'll be keeping an eye on it and hopefully I'll catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so the Trade Union Congress 2023 is underway right now. Wowzers, exciting stuff, Damo. Think of it as like a party political conference for all the different trade unions to come together and find some common ground, if you will. But one motion in particular, notably supported by Sharon Graham's Unite, has got people up in arms. Though maybe that's a poor choice of words given the circumstances. The motion brought forward by the right wing led GMB Union is motion C21, Solidarity with Ukraine. Maybe this doesn't seem like anything particularly unusual. There is a lot of support going on in the UK for Ukraine right now. But from a trade union standpoint, from a trade unionist point of view, this ought to be pretty worrying, actually. And I'll come to the why that is presently. First, let's have a, a look at this situation between Russia and Ukraine, because the way the media portray it, the way they want you to regard it, it's very black and white, isn't it? Russia bad, Ukraine good. 
It's very easy to do that when Russia did invade Ukraine. But as always, the situation isn't black and white. It's full of shades of grey. Now, I don't want to focus on Russia too much here. For one, I've covered the issue in other videos. For two, the TUC motion is in relation to Ukraine specifically. But NATO expansion eastwards, whatever you think of Putin, is a provocation. It was a provocation, especially when you consider such expansion was promised not to happen in order to see the Berlin Wall brought down way back when. The West has not kept to that. Now, you can make arguments for saying Putin's own actions drove that. You can make arguments that the West have poked the bear. Like I say, it's grey areas, not black and white. We're not in a spaghetti Western here. All the good guys wear the white hats and all the bad guys wear the black ones. Equally, Ukraine isn't all sunshine and flowers itself. A coup left it basically a puppet government of the US on Russia's doorstep, poking the bear. Yes, they're the ones who have been attacked. And yes, they're the ones that have been invaded. As much as the focus of Volodymyr Zelensky and the media is one of asking for help, asking for aid, for arms, taking the fight to the Russians, it's not only that that should be a matter of concern, but the other actions he has taken under the cover of this war as well. From the military perspective, if I start with that, it's the one that we all think of first and foremost, isn't it? The main beef most in the West have with Ukraine, the main criticism we have of the Ukrainians, is the neo-Nazis they literally have in their armed forces. The Azov Battalion, replete with all manner of fascist iconography and emblazoned across all of their livery as it is. People will deny their presence. Zelensky is Jewish, they say. Why would he endure such a thing? Well, they're there. A UN moratorium on condemning Nazism was passed in 2021, with only two countries, in fact, refusing to vote for it. In fact, they voted against it, no less. And they were the US and Ukraine. So answer that one. Military aid to Ukraine, as far back as 2018, so well before the Russian invasion, when the US were active in Ukraine, puppet government and all of that, they passed a bill in the US to supply arms to Ukraine. But there was a stipulation in that. And that stipulation was that none of it was to go to the Azov Battalion. They argue that they are, pa they are, they are patriots, not Nazis, this battalion. But when you're wearing the symbology that you wear, and we're long known to be present in Ukraine before war broke out in Russia, having existed since 2014, having built up by recruiting extremists from across the globe, as they have, it's, it's not something people are going to ignore and are going to set aside. But for the purposes of this video which is not going to concentrate on that let's set that aside because the main reason for this video and why it comes down to trade unionism and why it bothers so many of us in the trade union movement and in unite as i am is the fact that zelensky has used the war to dismantle labor rights ukraine say this is essential in the face of the war but is it because what they've done is remove the rights at work on working hours working conditions unfair dismissal they have given employers increased leverage over their workforces. This all came into law last August, Law 5371, really catchy title, gripping stuff. But what it means is for as long as the country remains under martial law, but ultimately uh, the, this, these, these things will remain in effect. But ultimately it means some 70% of the Ukrainian workforce have lost significant rights at work. We all very much take for granted here. Perhaps we take them too much for granted here, given the sort of government we've got these days. But they've lost their rights to collective bargaining. They've lost significant rights at work. And Ukraine's Federation of Trade Unions has been rendered largely toothless. The entire thing has been opposed, naturally, as you would expect. But you won't have heard about it. You'd be lucky if you've heard about these laws going through at all. Uh, not, not least of which by the Federation of Trade Unions themselves, which is basically Ukraine's equivalent of RTUC, basically. So don't you find it a bit weird that our trade unions, that our TUC conference, aren't siding with them? with Zelensky and their government instead. Don't you find that weird? Don't think so. The TUC here did complain at the time about these laws being passed in Ukraine. Yet now they're passing motions of support with the government there instead. It is bizarre. Incidentally, another two far less well-reported laws, not that this news was particularly well-reported itself, but even less well-reported were two other laws that were also signed off just before this one was. One of them Legalize zero hour contracts in the country. I wonder if Bozo and one of his paid for jollies sold the idea to his buddy Zelensky, but that law will stay in place after martial law is lifted. So that's almost blatantly an opportunistic move against their own workforce by the Ukrainian government. And the other law allows employers to stop paying workers who've been called up to fight. So how perverse is that? About as perverse as this solidarity motion with Ukraine by trade unionists, in which case, don't you find? Let's have a look at that motion then, just the accusations made, just to justify the solidarity of this motion that they're saying. 
Congress unequivocally condemns Russia's illegal, aggressive, aggressive invasion of Ukraine. Congress notes, one, the systematic repression of free trade unions under Putin and Lukashenko and their suppression in the occupied territories of Ukraine since 2014. Two, appeals from Ukrainian unions for moral and material aid, including the means of Ukraine's self-defense. Three, that those who suffer most in times of war are the working class and that the labor movement must do all it can to prevent conflict. However, that is not always possible. Four, the TUC's proud history of solidarity with victims of fascist imperialist aggression included support for arms to the Spanish Republic. As trade unionists, we are inherently anti-imperialistic and our job is to fight imperialism and tyranny at every opportunity. We recognize that a victory for Putin in Ukraine will be a success for reactionary authoritarian politics across the world. Five, the horrendous human and environmental cost of the Ukrainian conflict. Millions of people have been forced to abandon their homes and flee, while many others have lost their lives. Six, the Russian program of ethnic cleansing. And finally, seven, that trade unions across Ukraine have shown true solidarity and support by offering shelter and food to refugees. Azalev has worked closely with Ukrainian rail unions and seen the tremendous work that they have done to support workers in these times of conflict. OK, let's take them one by one and shred them, basically. Point one, repression of free trade unions by Putin in Russia. Yes. Lukashenko in Belarus. Yes. The law 5371 in Ukraine was ratified by Zelensky, ratified by the Ukrainian government against its own people. So why no mention of that there? You are willfully ignoring the actions going on in Ukraine here. You kicked off about law 5371 when it was passed last August. Why is that not in your motion? Are you on the side of all workers or just some of them? Is collective bargaining for all or just a few? Point two, appeals from Ukraine's trade unions for moral or material aid, including self-defense, from Russia or from your own government here. They aren't exactly on your side in all of this. If they're ramming through anti-worker legislation, that will remain once this war is over. Point three, those that suffer most of the working class, that can't always be prevented in times of war. Sadly true. Point four, the TUC of a proud history of solidarity of victims of fascism. Well, that's ropey ground when some of UK's troops themselves are fascists. And it's pretty tyrannical in my mind to hit workers' rights at a time of war. Don't you agree? Five, I totally agree with. Six, I don't argue with either. Though, again, this is a grey area in Ukraine too. And seven, yes, welcoming refugees is great to see. And doing so in a time of war is a great thing to be doing. Though, how many refugees, perhaps fleeing war, want to be homed in a country also at war? I can't imagine, frankly. It seems odd. Azlef incidentally seconded this GMB motion, which for a left-leaning union, as I actually think of them, I also found this rather odd, but given their own involvement with Ukrainian trade unions on a one-to-one -one level, perhaps that can be explained via point seven. There is no escaping the fact, though, that for all the fine words of this motion that Volodymyr Zelensky tore up workers' rights when he saw the chance to, so are trade unions offering solidarity via this motion, appalls me. Russian aggression might be the immediate threat, but disenfranchisement looks set to replace that when all is said and done. You can argue Russia winning might be worse for them, but the least worst option still isn't a good one. So why are our unions queuing up to support that? Well, right-wing ones, trade unions with right-wing leaderships, and it should be remembered that trade unions are far more politically diverse than political parties are. So the GMB pushing this might not be too surprising. Others like Unison passing it won't be a surprise to many trade unionists either. But yet again, Unite hasn't failed to disappoint. Sharon Graham, a supposed left-wing candidate to run the union, has proven to be a populist, frankly, in my view, taking whatever action she thinks will give her a publicity boost. Yet in reality, she has repeatedly stood by Keir Starmer, even inviting him to Unite's conference a few months ago and banning any delegates who wouldn't keep silent while he spoke, desperate to talk up, speak out against him as they were. She's put him on notice more time than he's, times than he's told a lie, and he seems to do that with every other drawn breath. She's been directly linked to the banning of the Jeremy Corbyn film The Big Lie in Unite Properties, something appalling the left, largely, widely, an important piece of work exposing the factional damage done to the party she funds to keep it out of power by the same people running it today. She'll likely feature prominently in the planned sequel. To people singularly sick and tired of her conduct, this may not surprise too many people either. Across social media, people are raging over this latest move, ending their Unite memberships over it. Nobody gets involved in trade unionism to see those that purport to stand for our rights at work abandoning their fellow working class citizens in sister unions in other countries. Yet that is what this motion is, in my view, doing. It is all about bash Russia, ignoring all the bad that has happened and is still happening with regards to workers' rights in Ukraine. What is Sharon thinking is a tweet I've read over and over. In my opinion, she's thinking the same thing she always does about herself.
What do you reckon about the actions of our unions in relation to this motion, though? Are you disgusted or do you back it? Are you thinking of leaving your respective union over this or have you already done so? Tell me all about it. Is there too much whitewashing of Ukraine in this conflict or do you disagree? And why is that? Have your say in the comments. Join in the conversation. Tell me about it. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where the Tories a few months ago were all set for sending Ukraine typhoon jets, no less. But there was a, a wee problem with that. And, well, I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so taxing the rich. That's a good idea, isn't it? We like this idea. It's getting a lot of traction, a lot of conversation at the minute. Taxing the rich. Well, taxes. Anyone disagree at this point, though? They're absolutely bogged down with money. They can fill swimming pools with the stuff if they wanted to. But if anyone has made the case for it in the last week, it's the permanently angry, shriveled walnut that is Alan Sugar. Stuff the Lord Sugar. Stuff the Sir Alan nonsense. The London wide boy made good and has spent much of his time as a billionaire since pulling the ladder up behind him. If there wasn't money in it for him making The Apprentice, for instance, you could be sure he wouldn't be doing it. Well, like so many inordinately wealthy people, he's tried to avoid paying tax, you see. That's just why he's in the news. This is why I'm drawing attention to this. He'd been off in Australia filming its version of Celebrity Apprentice, so Sugar tried arguing for non-residency here, effectively claiming he spends no more than 90 days a year here, having been in Australia for months on end, and all despite the fact he'd just drawn one of the biggest dividends in UK history from his business empire for himself, a dividend to the tune of £390 million. That's what he planned to pay himself, just for the year 2020-2021, I believe it was. He thought he could do that without paying any tax on it, too. A tax figure that would have amounted to £186 million. I don't have to pay it, he said. I haven't been in Britain. Disregard the tax bill. Unfortunately for Sugar, he's not nearly as clever as he thinks he is. All those times he snarled at someone for not calling him Lord Sugar's. Let's come back to bite him. There's a little bit of karma over this because that seat of his in the House of Lords that he's so fond of, so fond of pointing to in his title that he rarely ever parks his posterior in, nonetheless, has become his undoing, you see. Because if you've accepted a seat in the House of Lords, you are a de facto British, res British resident at all times. So nice try, Alan. Pay your damn tax bill. Well, as you can imagine, he will have had one of his little tantrums, stamping his tiny feet, screaming, if I'd known that, I would have quit the House of Lords. Well, so much for how big of a deal it is for you to be called Lord Sugar then, eh? Seems that that has a, a price tag on it too. An honour, a peerage, all secondary to his own greed, apparently. Even paying the bill leaves him with £204 million, full of a year to live on. So what planet is he on that that's not enough? Andrew Pearce recently attacked benefits claimants for the hundreds of hospitals that can be built if the government decided to strip them of cash they need just to survive on. But a rich twerp like Sugar, oh, that'll be fine. Let him keep his money. That's more cash than we'll ever see in our lifetimes. It's just one year's dividend for Sugar. He'll be taking millions again next time. You can bet he won't be building any hospitals with it, though. Look at it another way. Alan Sugar said several years ago that if Jeremy Corbyn ever became Prime Minister, he'd leave the country, and now he's trying to claim he had left under a Tory one in order to avoid paying his taxes. The calls for a wealth tax are just mounting up and up, and they are more than justified in which case. That's why Sugar was terrified of Corbyn. He spent years attacking him on social media and attacking anyone who called him out for it because he was scared. Ultimately, the man's greed is so preposterous, he was literally afraid of a wealth tax. Sugar is worth £1.2 billion already. He couldn't spend that in a lifetime, in several lifetimes. And he's in his late 70s now, so how much more lifetime has he got? It's greed for greed's sake. But a 1% wealth tax on wealth above £10 million, which is one wealth tax proposal that was going around, it was the most modest one. So very rich people would raise £10 billion for the Treasury. And for Alan Sugar, a 1% tax on £1.19 billion, that's his £1.2 billion minus £10 million, would land him with a tax bill of just £11.9 million. I say just £11.9 million, but when he's worth £1.2 billion, that's not a lot, is it? He'd still have nigh on £1.19 billion of his own, in which case. It's so little that when you, you, you go to a couple of decimal places, the amount of money he's paying up just simply vanishes. Such a small fraction of his wealth, they wouldn't touch the sides. He'd probably more than make it back in a year. Yet for years, he's wailed about it like a spoilt child. 
Now he's moaning about having to pay tax under the Tories because he thought he was being clever and getting away with it and avoiding paying such tax. Perhaps he wouldn't have taken such a large dividend if he thought he would have to pay tax on it. Did you just take it out to show off? Do you take that much money out of your business just to say, look at me, aren't I big, aren't I clever, haven't I got lots of money? Is that what gets you off these days? Is this the only reason you have so much money? Willy waving contests to other rich people. I really can't think of another reason for it because you can't bloody spend it all. Whatever the reason, it's clearly never enough when you can be that rich and still complain about having to pay your way. He's made these arguments before. He argues he's this wealth creator. And if you tax them too much, they'll run away. Well, you ran away to Australia any, anyway, Alan. And if you hadn't, they'd have got somebody else over there, wouldn't they? If you were to sort off from the UK, you wouldn't be missed for one. And your business interests would soon be taken by others. Hopefully others who would do a damn sight less whinging than you do over having to pay your taxes, even when you can afford to pay large sums and still be ridiculously rich. The more you earn, the more you can pay. And frankly, when you know that contributes to the running of society, that should be a source of pride for you. I can afford to pay more than other people. Why is that not what gets you off? But you don't care about such things, do you, Alan? You don't care about public services being funded. You don't care about society struggling. You don't care about people struggling because you used to be the equivalent of Del Boy Trotter. And look where you are now. Aren't I big? Aren't I clever? Haven't I been a wonderfully successful businessman? Yes, you have. But you think that if you can do it, anyone can. Trouble is, you missed the point that if everyone did it, nobody would be rich. And what would you do then for an ego trip? Society doesn't work that way. If it did, you wouldn't get away with making crap TV like The Apprentice, for starters. Pay your share on what you make. The more you make, good for you, but the more tax you can afford to pay in turn. That doesn't happen in our society. It'll certainly never happen when you have people on the Sunday Times rich list literally running the country. Not that anyone elected soon act to do that anyway, either. Should Sugar be fined for this, do you think? Should he be punished in some way? He probably won't. He'll pay his tax, grumbling all the while, I'm sure. The embarrassment of being caught out, though, is something he shouldn't be allowed to ever forget. The man could do with more lessons in humility, in my opinion. But if you dare accidentally claim too much money topping up your wages, as we often see happen all the time with universal credit claimants, not necessarily the fault of the claimant at all, because the system is rubbish, you can bet the government will chase you down for that. The rich are revered and the poor are despised. And Alan Sugar's attitude exemplifies that completely. His conduct is absolutely shameless. He's another reminder why the Lords need abolishing, because apart from anything else, this man with his attitudes, when he bothers to turn up, is in a position to make and shape laws in this country. And you can bet he only does so in his own interests, when it suits him, because I honestly do not think he cares about anyone or anything else at all, when his greed appears to be all-consuming, as his complaints, in my view, clearly show. I can't believe you think about anything else. To some extent, I pity him. How empty must you be when you get like that? The grifters and sponges in this country are not the sick, the disabled, the out of work, the refugees, the asylum seekers. It's people with so much money, they end up in positions where they can get away with trying to deny paying their fair share, though, when we all have to do that. Next time another Andrew Pierce pops up shouting about shirkers, the first people you should think of are tax avoiders and tax evaders, because they're taking far more cash out of the nation's coffers and the public purse than anyone else. What do you think, though? Is Sugar entitled to keep his cash of a broader? Is he every bit the living embodiment of Ebenezer Scrooge here? How do we flip this narrative of Shirkers onto the rich not paying taxes and off those with the least, most often being exploited themselves, to make other people richer? Add your thoughts to the comments. Be part of the conversation on this. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video where... Rishi Sunak has been helping the wealth divide to prosper, not close, as two-thirds of all new wealth last year apparently went to the richest 1%, the likes of Alan Sugar. So, fat chance of getting on top of that with this sorry bunch, is there? I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so, Jonathan Gullis, the Tory stinker from Stoke, the best description I've heard made of him, though, was calling him a shaved baboon that looks like he was dragged backwards through Top Man, though, given what passes for political discourse emanating from him, I'd suggest upside down and back to front through Top Man would be more accurate, since he appears to be spending his hopefully short stint in Parliament talking out of his glow-in-the-dark red baboon backside. He's part of a new faction that has sprung up within the Tory party, though, calling themselves, imaginatively, the New Conservatives. But they're about as new as Jacob Rees-Mogg is down with the kids. 
And what they mean by it is they're chiefly a block of red wall Tory MPs elected at the last election and probably amongst the most likely Tories to lose their seats again at the next one. Having won them on the basis of Brexit, holding them given what a pig's ear the Tories have made of that, holding them looks pretty unlikely and actually that demonstrates a problem for the Tories given and this particular faction given they're the political equivalent of lemmings on the edge of a cliff waiting to jump their political careers are probably almost over on the other hand I'm sure they would argue that if Rishi Sunak and co in their cozy safe true blue Tory safe seats want any chance of holding the red wall then they ought to listen to them a bit more but then we remind ourselves the one speaking right now is Gullis and the idea of anyone taking him seriously he should have us all wetting ourselves laughing and what he's come out with this time ought to do just that, whilst flipping the bird to him at the same time for what he thinks is a good idea. You see, Gullis is now of the view that university is a luxury, a luxury that should be reserved for high achievers and not something that ought to be accessible to everyone. Instead, there should be greater emphasis on apprenticeships, he says. Now, I have no beef with apprenticeships at all. I did one at 16. Got a trade under me belt, as me old man would say. Proud he was, tear in the eye when I brought home those indentures. But I'm also reminded that I secured one of 11 places where there were some 800 applicants for them. We're back in the John Major years, I should add, for context, 1995 as it was. But the thing is, although numbers of places for apprenticeships have fluctuated over the years, they've always been competitive to secure. They aren't accessible to all. There isn't one ready-made for anyone or everyone even, to just walk into, because there simply are not enough places, and never have been in them. They're run by businesses, after all. There are government incentives for them to do so, but many will have been affected by economic upheaval in no small part caused by this government in one way or another. Brexit has hit many adversely, with all the additional red tape they've now got to endure. The cost of living crisis has meant less money being spent in the economy, which drives the economy, so businesses are investing less, including in training new staff or skilled workers, or indeed taking on apprentices. Austerity has also hammered the economy, as we all have less to go around, and so we spend less too, and we've seen numerous businesses not just unable to invest, but are unable to continue trading. And although the obvious first thought when we talk about such things in this context of the high street, there are indeed apprenticeships in retail. But equally, industry has been hit. Look at how many times Tata Steel have tried to get out and the government has instead bailed them out and pleaded with them to stay. Look at car manufacture. These industries offer apprenticeships too, but when they're struggling, how many places will they have, if any, to offer? They won't be increasing, will they? Not unless significant government incentivization comes in. And kids doing them these days also are paid peanuts to do them too. So, great idea, more apprenticeships. I have no argument with that. But for one, not everyone wants to go down that route. Some have dreams of taking on a professional career rather than a skilled trade. And for two, given how you've been trashing the country for some 13 years, where are they going to come from? Well, I do have issue with the odious Gullis' suggestion that he's driving for, these calls for apprenticeships, are at the expense of university places, because a luxury, he calls them. Well, they must be if you got through with a degree, eh, sunshine? I still can't get over the fact this guy was himself a teacher. What kind of teacher was he? I wonder if anybody who's watching this ever had him as a teacher. I'd, I'd love to get your... Your, uh, your feedback on him, especially with his views on university now as he's got. But essentially, he doesn't think low achievers, low achievers, how do you measure that, should be able to go when he wants to do away with so-called Mickey Mouse degrees. On the first point, it's very grammar school sounding, isn't it? Only the best go forward. Those who don't score highly enough can go flip burgers or sweep the streets for the rest of their lives, do something we can look down on. You have to appreciate the amount of work that goes on in schools with children with special educational needs. It's the first one that comes to my mind. The goal is for them to do well in school and go on to do other things, better things, to be able to live their lives and get the best out of their education. Other children benefit more from coursework-based learning rather than tons and tons of exams. These children will be left behind by a purely academia-driven education system as the toys have put in place. And if Gullis were to get what he wants... Only the best should go to university. He calls it a luxury. They already get 14 years of free education. How dare they want more? Doing his best Mr. Bumble impression, puffing his chest out and going red at the same time. Baboon's backside as he is and speaking just as much sense out of it. 
How much debt would these kids then be in? Student loan repayments have already just been made harsher, now repayable over 40 years instead of 30. So kids taking degrees from this year, such as my own son, face appalling levels of debt, and they might only repay them after they start earning £25,000. But with the need for more and more money to just get by, as we seem to see year on year, incomes having to rise year on year as everything keeps getting more expensive, surely that £25,000 goal is going to be reached in the near future in all likelihood by a, the vast majority of earners. And then it's a 9% tax effectively on all incomes above that. Another regressive tax when people won't have enough to live on as it is, and all because they chose to go to university. I guarantee they won't shift that repayment threshold if that comes to pass. It's not just the kids coming under attack with Tory MPs champing at the bit to deny them the chance of going to uni, though. They're also attacking the unis themselves for taking advantage of the children by encouraging, them, encouraging kids to take on degrees that offer nothing for them in the future, in their view, and saying they give the, the taxpayer poor value for money when kids take up a creative or a performing arts degree. Ah, so that's now unimportant, is it? Mickey Mouse degrees, are they? A lot of people would argue differently. Besides, universities place a great deal of emphasis on employability these days, and not just working in the student bar or at Subway while studying, but afterwards too. Also, the end result piece of paper isn't the whole of the benefit from the university experience either. There is learning to live away from home for the first time. Independence in both how you live your day-to-day -day lives, how you manage money, building confidence in doing that, and so much more. My boy going up this year is heading to Plymouth. No, he's not doing politics, in case anybody has. People have asked me before about this when I brought it up. Though he would rinse a political gibbon like Gullis. He's doing acting, which no doubt would send Gullis into an apoplectic rage. But he's had to work incredibly hard, not just to get the marks to get on that course, but he's had to go through rounds of auditions to do so too. It is not a course kids just walk into. No degree is. The same goes for any creative study, of course. You have to demonstrate some aptitude for it, for the university to offer you a place. They can place conditions on it. A pity Gullis didn't have some, to demonstrate some aptitude for politics before the Tories put him up for their candidate in Stoke. But then they're as lacking in talent as they are in empathy and morals. Gullis and his Red Wall faction want to block low achievers from obtaining student loans. Someone could be the next Picasso, but can't pass maths for love nor money. He wants to slash university places by 15% and demand more apprenticeships, which have to come from somewhere, but there's no answer for that forthcoming from him either. It's a scapegoating, blame gaming. Someone has to be at fault for things going wrong. Can't be the Tories. They've only been in power for 13 years. Clearly, therefore, they're still undoing all the damage the last Labour government created. These rancid right-wingers are actually the biggest whinging snowflakes going because they always have to blame something to excuse other stuff going wrong. It's never their fault. So, But when they're so stupid, like Jonathan Gullis apparently is, to be blaming in part his own boss, Sunak, though, there's no benefit politically for them at all. It won't be Sunak losing his seat anytime soon, as safe as he is in his. It is Gullis, you absolute dunce, that's going to be losing yours. Whenever Gullis thinks of the employability prospects for uni grads on courses he doesn't like, he should spend far more time concerning himself with what he'll be doing after he loses his own seat to come the next election, because that's the only reality in anything coming out of this story. And we will all celebrate this Burke in particular, getting marked down, give it a big F for fail, and packing his bags for home. What do you think, though? Does Gullis have a point? Are there some degrees you see as worthless? And how would you justify that? Is it up to the child to do what is best for them, their interests, their creative talents or academic talents if they go down that road? And that's the sort of course they're doing. Did you go to uni and what benefits did you come away with aside from hopefully graduating? What else did you learn from your experience there? Do you have a chat to me in the comments about it. I'd love to hear all. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did more content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation for you where perhaps it shouldn't surprise us that Gullis thinks so little of, in his words, underachieving kids. He showed he couldn't care less about migrant children disappearing from detention centres either back in January by saying it was their own fault they disappeared because they came here. I remind you all, this was Guy was a teacher with a duty of care for kids before becoming an MP. I sincerely hope he never becomes one again with an attitude like his. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks.
Right, so the ongoing goings-on with Hackney Labour that I've covered in a couple of videos now have been significantly problematic for Starmer's Labour, and it would seem his answer to that is to effectively just seize control of everything. Give it here, I'll take it back, I'm in charge now, grrr. Well, regular viewers will recall that I covered the story of Thomas Dewey, the Labour councillor permitted to stand for Labour for Hackney Borough Council, despite already being under investigation for possession and manufacture of indecent images of children. He was sentenced recently, a slap wrist sentence. We were largely disgusted by this, of course. Then news broke that Hackney's mayor, Philip Glanville, had been suspended by the Labour Party after a photo appeared, showing him socialising with Dewey, no less, at a Eurovision party earlier this year. Glanville was socialising with somebody who was under investigation at that point and later convicted of possession of those indecent images. So it raised the hypocrisy going on in the party leadership because, of course, Starmer's very close advisor just happens to be that very good friend of convicted child sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein, a certain Peter Mandelson. Presumably, Glanville is disposable collateral damage. But don't mention Mandy. No, 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 no. At any rate, things have gotten even worse in Hackney Labour as now the entire elected and notably left-wing executive committee of Hackney Labour have been entirely deposed and wiped out by Labour Party staffers who have been come in and replaced them and installed replacements. Why, you might ask. Well, they've been blowing the whistle on Dewey already. Labour didn't want to know. And Dewey, who was part of the right-wing Labour to win faction or the Labour Party, just happened to be the faction headed up by the eternally odious Luke Akers, whose day job is shilling for the apartheid state of Israel. Well, the left was blowing the whistle on Dewey. They were expressing significant safeguarding issues in relation to this case and this matter. And in the last several days, they've been demanding Philip Glanville quit as mayor instead of temporarily stepping aside, as he has done in light of his suspension. There's no mayoral election in Hackney until 2026. So even if Labour were to expel him at this point, he could just remain in place as an independent until then. But it's not just Labour uh, or the Labour left demanding Glanville go at this point, because up to 50 Hackney residents protested at the town hall just this week demanding he go as well. And the Hackney Greens have tabled a motion of no confidence in him too. So they really are working hard to get rid of this guy. They do not want him as their mayor or representing them any longer. The argument by the Hackney Labour left, though, is that safeguarding should supersede politics. And surely that's a no-brainer. That is obvious. Of course, this is true. Who could possibly argue with that? Well, evidently the Labour right can. As I said at the start, the entire elected left-wing executive of Hackney Labour have been ditched in a show that can only be described as authoritarian and completely dictatorial because they've been replaced by a load of unelected Labour right-wingers imposed in Hackney. Now, I've covered numerous examples of right-wingers abusing democratic structures to get their way within the Labour Party, but here, democracy just got binned, just got sidelined, shoved aside. They've been installed, and that's just completely undemocratic. But even worse than that, all the people installed also happen to be from Labour to win. The very same faction that put Thomas Dewey up for selection and subsequently election, who they counted amongst their ranks. And they have replaced the left wing because they were making too much noise about that. They were screaming to the Labour leadership about safeguarding. And the Labour leadership appeared to consider shutting them up more important. However, the reason given for this is over boundary issues again. Now, I've spoken about the boundary issues that, uh, or the way that the Labour right Starmer's faction have weaponized this in other areas of the country. Currently, it is their favorite thing to weaponize against the left uh, in order to get their own way and get rid of candidates they don't want anymore. Certainly left-wing MPs they really don't want anymore. So this does throw another reason into the mix to have seen this happen, though. Although the timing of it really does make it look like it's just a blatant case of gagging those calling for greater safeguarding in light of the crimes of their former councillor. But there's also the issue of Hackney's MP in all of this, the still suspended and very much left wing Diane Abbott. And having a right wing CLP executive does not bode well for Diane Abbott's reselection, does it? Though the optics of seeing the first black woman MP ditched in favour of a Starmerite drone come the next election would, well, be rather offensive to say the least, but wouldn't exactly be much of a surprise. The thing is, it's still an abuse to impose a new executive here, even based on Labour's own rules relating to boundary changes. Because under the arrangements introduced by Labour to manage these boundary changes, only CLPs affected by a greater than 15% change require a new executive going into the next election. And this is not the case in Hackney. So if Abbott is the real target, Labour are abusing their own rules, their own agreed 
boundary change arrangements to do that. If shutting up those talking about their concerns in relation to safeguarding of the real targets, then clearly kids aren't safe with this Labour administration in charge, since they clearly don't care about them. If they do care about them, installing members of the same faction as Thomas Dewey is a truly awful choice to make. But then I've often wondered just how much clout Luke Akers has within the Labour Party. I've always suspected it is far more than he should. And should that ever be proven to be the case, he needs to answer for that too. I certainly don't believe Keir Starmer is really the person in charge. What is the opinion of those ousted from Hackney Labour then? They feel it is all part of the plan to destroy Hackney North as a left-wing entity, which it has been for a considerable amount of time. And when the time comes, they will parachute in a right-wing candidate, and then it will be all over. And Diane Abbott's days now seem numbered. I wonder how Labour members react to that, should it come to pass? So Abbott's been their MP since 1987. She has a commanding majority there. Would they take kindly to seeing her deposed in what is a blatantly factional manner? She was suspended over a poorly worded article when the wrong draft of said article got published. Crime of the century, I know. But the setup we're seeing is familiar. It's been used in other parts of the country against other left-wing MPs to great success for Starmer & Co. So should we really be surprised that they're doing it again? Of course, this tactic hasn't always worked as CLPs have collapsed. Executives have refused to... Uh, be able to run themselves anymore and others have refused to take their places and CLPs just don't function any longer and people of course refuse to campaign they refuse to doorstep and all the rest of it the more Labour keep doing this the more I can see more Labour members downing tools and refusing to get out that boat and the boots on the ground game will disappear which has always been Labour's strongest electioneering tactic and polling does not reflect that people simply won't go out they won't do it I can see the same happening here. Members elected their own executive. Now it's been replaced in what amounts to a local coup imposed by the National Party. What kind of Democrat accepts that? I certainly wouldn't. And I should imagine a great many others wouldn't either. Would you? Would you campaign for a party who imposed the local management on you after you had elected others? Would you campaign for a party that abuses its own rules to do so whenever it sees fit? What do you reckon is the truth of the matter here? Is Abbott the real target? Or is it a desperation to shut up local members concerned over safeguarding issues within the party that happens to be embarrassing some people on their own patch? Have you say on this in the comments below. Be part of the conversation. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did more content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where Diane Abbott's horribly worded letter was just that, badly worded. But the response soon unveiled Labour's hierarchy of racism again, as recorded in the Ford report. And indeed, Martin Ford himself defended Abbott over this story. Not that that means anything to Starmer and his faction, and I'll hopefully catch you on the next bid. Cheers, folks. Right, so there's an election rolling around in the none-too-distant future. I don't know whether you might have heard a thing or two about that rumour on the grapevine. You must have heard something somewhere along the lines. And for those of us who have seen a general election or two in our times, we know this invariably results in whatever party is currently in power, no matter how awful they've been, how terrible their policies might have been for us personally or for the country, no matter how many times they've touched and sucked air through their teeth going, oh, we can't afford to do this, that or the other, magically, in the run-up to an election, they find some money to say, oh, yes, we can. They can manage to find something to try and bribe us, the electorate, with. And so it goes with current Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt. But when the Tories have been in power for 13 years and have been so catastrophically bad as they have with the economy, how can they possibly find a sweetener or two now that could possibly appeal to us? Easy! Let's punish those who never vote for them. To bribe those who might, and actually what Hunt is cooking up might as well have come out of Liz Truss's playbook. Tory sweeteners inevitably mean talk of tax cuts. But having seen the economy flatlining for years, pretty much now, and Brexit having done it absolutely no favours either, are tax cuts really something that we need to talk about right now? Are they really befitting us at this point in time? If he's going to give out some completely unnecessary, economically stupid, public spending restricting tax cuts out at this moment in time, in order to be seen laughably as financially credible to some people, he has to look like they've got to be paid for somewhere. And so his answer to that is apparently going to be to hammer benefit claimants yet again. Because when isn't that always popular with the frothing right-wing voters and the equally rancid right-wing media such as Andrew Pearce? Now, just as an aside, for those of you familiar with the fact that I did a video about Andrew Pearce and what he said about benefit claimants the other day, 
just as an example of how not credible some of our media are. I had something rather unusual happen the other day. Just as a, a brief aside here, I did a video on Andrew Pierce's benefit bashing comment in his Mail Online column the other day. And as is my usual practice on YouTube, I put links to articles mentioned in my video into the description so people can check these things out themselves, not just necessarily take my word for stuff. You can check what I'm saying against other material because I take pride in my research. Funny thing is, though, I got a content removed email from YouTube afterwards, not to remove my video, which is what I thought it was to start with, horrified I was, but to remove one of these source links. And their justification for it was that they felt it violated their spam, deceptive practices and scams policy. Well, the link they removed just happened to be the link to Andrew Pierce's article. His vicious attack on benefit claimants was viewed by YouTube as deceptive, as a scam or as spam behaviour. If that doesn't nail right-wing media narratives on benefits, when even a global multi-billion pound corporation like Google, who own YouTube, won't allow such narratives to pervade or even be linked to, even in a video that was tearing those same narratives a new one, that really does say something about our press, doesn't it? Needless to say, for the sake of my channel, I won't be linking to mail articles ever again, even if I happen to be challenging something they happen to be saying. But back to the, the main point here. We've got a government essentially jumping on that same bandwagon as Andrew Pearce, though. Hunt is mulling over a real terms cuts to benefits in the midst of a cost of living crisis, with food bank queues growing ever longer, at the same time fewer people are able to contribute to them. So we can give tax cuts to people that probably don't need it. Those on benefits may be in work themselves for one. So a tax cut to them, paid for by a benefit cut also affecting them, will do nothing for their incomes whatsoever. They may be disabled and unable to work. They may be long-term sick. But of course, Mel Stride at the DWP is reforming things there so that by the nature of how the government measures sickness, rather than by any measure of people getting better, many of these people will likely soon be found fit for work again. And we saw what happened before there, didn't we? 120,000 people died after being found fit for work. So clearly they weren't if it ended up killing them. So a tax cut to whom is going to incentivize them to vote Tory, in which case it'll be businesses, the corporations, the wealthy, workers already on high wage packets, perhaps earning enough that they don't need Social Security to boost their incomes. Clearly not those struggling the most. They're the ones who will end up being targeted. But the sweetener round just before an election, it's never about that. It's about convincing people who might vote Tory that they're still worth a vote. And they do this every time because it works. People will see this selfishly as a benefit to them, whether they need it or not. And it doesn't matter if within months of getting back into power for another five years, the Tories reverse it all again. They'll have pulled off the con. You'll have fallen for it once again. They're in power for another five years. More damage to be done. Stuff you. You won't be needed for another five years. And then perhaps they'll come back with the same sweetness to you again. Will you be fooled again and again and again? And it's all about making our lives hell all over again. If Tory sweeteners are convincing you to vote for them here and now, you've got the memory of a bloody goldfish. Of course, this is exactly what Liz Truss tried to do in her epic shambles of a budget, too. Uncosted tax cuts did for the country. Sent mortgages spiralling, piled on a ton of debt. Which is why if you cut taxes, you've got to cut spending elsewhere, not to pay for them, but to offset them. Because remember, taxation doesn't pay for anything in and of itself. The more tax a government takes, the more money it can then print to spend on other things. But if you're a government set on cutting taxes, then you are also at the same time cutting your own ability to spend on, for example, public services. Therefore, to cut taxes requires a cut in spending too. And Hunt's choice is to hit benefit claimants because they don't vote Tory as a rule. In fact, a great many of them don't vote at all. So there's no political incentive to ever help such people. By not voting, therefore, as a demographic, as too many of the poorest in society tend not to do, you end up a political target, in fact, a political football to kick around in order to attract the votes of those that do vote. Another excuse they could use to justify hitting benefits is if inflation does fall, as is still being predicted, and which Rishi Sunak has staked his name to, of course, when inflation was high, benefits got uprated by 10%. That was a big uprating, but it was still below inflation at that point. But inflation has now fallen below 10%. The Tories, being the abject horrors they are, could justify cutting benefits back to match that drop in inflation. But that ignores the freeze to benefits that has never been made up for that was justified by austerity under Cameron and Osborne. Therefore, benefits still remain too low anyway. 
Such a move would ensure that remains the case, worsens. And again, I'll repeat, a great many people on benefits are working. 40% of universal credit claimants are in work. Here's another reason this is stupid too. Official figures for the economy show that it's contracted, i.e. shrunk, by 0.5% in July. The government are getting a battering over this. Now, much of the press will be saying, oh, it's been a terrible summer. The weather's been awful, and that's why. And they're also blaming strike action for killing off the economy too. Damn you, Mick Lynch, and all of that. Hardly the fault of workers literally not getting by or feeling their industry isn't safe for them or their clientele, patients in hospitals, for instance, passengers on the railways. So they're going to go on strike to stand up for a better deal, better pay terms and conditions. Why people do it? But the economy is, of course, driven by people spending too. Give a tax cut to a rich man. Alan Sugar will appreciate it, I'm sure. He's still spitting rivets as he is found, found out he is, in fact, a UK resident for tax purposes, and he doesn't like that at all. But they won't spend it. They won't make their money work in the economy. It'll go into his Scrooge McDuck style money bin and never be seen again unless he chooses to go swimming in it. Those on benefits tend to spend all their disposable income because they have to, to survive, to get by. If they had more, if they were given enough to live, in fact, and not just exist, survive, the economy would actually grow more. Tax cuts, from an economic perspective, are idiotic. If you want to see the economy grow and the country start to do well, then taxation is the fee you pay to see that happen. It needs to be fair. It isn't right now. I completely agree with that. If Hunt wanted to offer tax cuts to the poorest workers and offset that with tax rises on the rich, that would make absolute perfect economic sense. Of course, they won't do that because they don't care about the economy or people or this country. They just care about hanging on to power by appealing to certain people for their votes by offering them sweeteners they don't need and do nothing to help society or the economy. We don't need tax cuts. We need a wealth tax. So this government can spend and invest again, put more money in the pockets of ordinary people who will spend it in the high street and get the economy growing, businesses benefiting, jobs being created and all the associated actions that follow from that. It really isn't a complex concept to grasp, but you will never find a mainstream media outlet or a mainstream party politician saying it right now. So I will repeatedly. And I hope you will, too. Perhaps you've watched this and you disagree with me entirely. Perhaps you're thinking, what would I know? Well, I just live it day to day like so many other people do in this country. But, you know, if I'm if if I'm so wrong, why don't you tell me why and justify that? Or am I right? In which case, who are you going to vote for since everybody seems to be talking about either tax cuts or not raising taxes at all as Labour are? Is there much hope of the economy getting fixed at this rate by either of them? Let me know in the comments below. Be part of the conversation. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did more content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where Labour and Rachel Reeves aren't making much different in their plans for the economy if you listen to her. In fact, she isn't even listening to her own economics advisor when it comes to a reversion to changing anything the Tories are already doing. And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so the Starmeroid takeover of local Labour organisations up and down the country seems to be spreading like a plague of locusts at the moment. And I've covered numerous examples of this in my videos, from Liverpool to Hackney, from Broxtow to Uxbridge, from Carmarthen to Wirral West. The list just keeps getting longer and longer as councillors are driven out and right-wingers take over. Boundary changes are used as a front to parachute in preferred right-wing Starmer-friendly candidates up and down the country. Ordinary Labour members, though, are turning around saying, no, we're not having this. Campaigning gets suspended. They down tools. They stop volunteering. The boots on the ground campaigning ends all over the place. Labour locally collapses and well, the regime just thinks, oh, we can stuff whoever in here then. Stuff these lot. Stuff these rotten lefties. And they'll put people in, not necessarily people who know the area or are particularly experienced. Local Labour members looking at this will refuse to work or campaign for them either. And the entire strategies of campaigning that Labour has always relied on completely fall apart. And Starmer thinks he can fix that by narcissistically plastering his own face all over the handbook for Labour's upcoming conference. Look at it. He's overdone the blusher for a start, trying to convince us of some colour in his cheeks when he's greyer than John Major's spinning image puppet, doing that peering off into the distance thing that he does. I'm sure he thinks it makes him look 
determined. To me, it looks like some corporate donor has their arm up his backside, ready to make him say whatever will win him some money for party coffers. But God forbid they act now because the Tories might not like it. That or it's Mandelson with his arm up there. His dad was a tool maker. Perhaps he had a sideline and puppet so because Keith's got strings on him and others are pulling them. Plus, he's as astute as a plank of wood when it comes to political performance. At any rate, whatever you make of Starmer's vanity here, let's not forget the authoritarianism going on. Because just in the last few days, yet another example has come out of the clampdown on dissent happening in more and more pockets around the country. This time, we're in Sheffield, where the Starmer regime has just suspended seven of its own councillors on Sheffield City Council for voting against the Labour whip at full council over the council's local plan, which is an extremely long-winded process many councils have gone through not all have, some are partway through the process too, to get one of these local plans approved. They're inordinately expensive. They involve a heck of a lot of work, a lot of consultations. They affect a great many things relating to council businesses, not least things like planning, the environment, businesses, and a lot more. It does put the council in more control, and that can be a good thing, but that, of course, depends on who runs the council. They take years to get approved, these local plans. And this one in Sheffield has apparently taken six years to get to this point, where having passed at the full council meeting anyway, Labour whipped to vote for it, it will now go to the government final approval. But seven Labour councillors defied the vote on this plan, including the former council leader, Terry Fox, and refused to vote for it. And all of a sudden they found themselves suspended by the Starmer regime back in Southside, back in London. Now Fox is... Worth mentioning here because he's not necessarily the most popular bloke in Sheffield. He ceased to be the Labour Council leader following this May's local elections, allegedly removed by the Labour Party NEC, though other reports I've seen say he just stepped down. This was all in the wake of mass tree felling apparently going on in Sheffield, which has had residents up in arms. He's still known as the guy who oversaw loads of tree felling. But that aside, it should be remembered that local councillors are elected to represent their constituents' interests too. So why did he and six others here and now, in this instance, oppose this local plan then? Well, it's had its controversies. There were some 3,000 local objections to a travelling show site, together with associated accommodation, along with industrial units being built on what is currently food-producing farmland, albeit land owned by the council, so they're selling it off. That's a lot of people objecting to a local plan, and local councillors are meant to listen to them, after all. As such, seven Labour councillors defied the whip on this plan because they were actually listening to constituents, I presume. Now, I think, now I know what you might be thinking. Is this racism then, a travelling show site? Is this anti-GRT community narrative, perhaps? No, it isn't. This development has been opposed locally for a long time, simply because it isn't suitable for development, and that's from Sheffield City Council's own assessment of the land. They deemed the site, when examining areas to build housing, unsuitable for housing. So why is it good enough to put travelling shows on as they come and go then? Besides the travelling show, if it isn't good enough for housing, why is it good enough for industrial units? How big? How many? Which actually take up the most room on this site. They're the big, it's actually the bigger issue. How often do travelling shows come along anyway? Does all this justify the loss of food producing land? You get a tarmac over a field for it. It needs to be solidly justified. Another significant local concern is that the roads around this field are already heavily congested and this development will drive more traffic there. So where is the solution to that? The site has also been assessed as high quality grade two land of equal quality, therefore, to the adjacent land, which is greenbelt land. Food producing high quality land assessed as unsuitable for development, for housing at any rate, and Sheffield City Council are pushing ahead with it anyway, just putting industrial units there mainly with some travelling showground room. Seven councillors said no, stood by their constituents, who have clearly been complaining by this in insignificant numbers, and now they've been suspended, not by Sheffield Labour Group, not by the group leader now, but by Starmer's regime in London. It was less than 24 hours ago, at time of writing, the Starmer put out a tweet saying, people with skin in the game should be making decisions in their area. With Labour, they will. Not if you're in Sheffield, it would seem, or in Liverpool, as you happen to be raising here in this tweet, where former Liverpool councillors got suspended and subsequently expelled, and as they are now proving with several having formed the Liverpool Community Independence, are now taking seats from Labour on that council, now able to make the decisions in their area based on the wishes of their constituents in their communities. Frankly, if he's already acting in areas he has some local administrative control over like this, what will he be like in charge of the whole country? 
do as I say, or you will be punished. Already there have been resignations locally relating to this issue, and the punishment of councillors standing up for local residents. It should be noted that across the council, only 37 councillors out of 84 actually voted for the local plan. So the Labour councillors were hardly the only ones who refused to vote for it. A good many weren't there at all. All of the Liberal Democrat group voted against it as another example. So just why Starmer and co get off in this blatant interference like this, I don't know. Why do they think what their right-wingers approve of, they now run the council since Terry Fox stood down, to no surprise, is more important than the actual wishes of the people who live there objecting to this? Why do they feel entitled to repeatedly impose diktat like this the country over? Or is this just another excuse to flex their desire to purge any semblance of objection because the more authoritarian you get, the more people are going to end up rejecting you at the ballot box? We've seen it in all the places you've done this so far before. You did it in Leicester going into the local elections and you lost council seats to the Tories there because of this. You're losing seats in Liverpool to the Liverpool Community Independence. There's another one they're fighting for at the moment and they've got every chance of taking that one off Labour too. You've had no functioning local party in Broxtow for six months because of this. In Carmarthen, they shut down your attempted imposition of a candidate. Now you've meted out mass suspensions there as well in petty revenge to, on the members daring to say no to you. Starmer is an absolute danger to democracy. The examples are numerous and growing, but they're local and they're low key. And therefore, the mainstream news continues to ignore them. It can't carry on being ignored, what is going on with, in Labour under Starmer. People don't vote for people just to ignore them. And as much as the Tories are reaping that right now, it'll be Labour's turn next if they insist on behaving like a bunch of dictators going forwards. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Do have your say in the comments below on this too and the other examples given. Have you been affected? Is there another example of this happening near you? Tell me all about it. We have to draw attention to these things somewhere. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where Rural West CLP executive have now resigned en masse at the news. All their chosen parliamentary candidates are being binned by Starmer's centralised dictatorship and only their selected right wingers can now be chosen from. Well, good luck doing that with yet another non-functioning local party that even if it gets up and running with other far less experienced right wing members again, nobody will campaign and vote for. It's control freak levels of idiocy on display by Starmer and if anything, we'll see Labour fail going into that next general election, as unlikely as polls make that look, it is entirely possible. It is acts like this adding up over the country that can see that happen. And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so when it comes to well-known members of the Labour Party, we tend to think in terms of MPs. Though, of course, well-known can be a bit of a stretch even for them when it comes to a large proportion of the British public. But for those of us who pay a little bit more attention, perhaps an unhealthy amount of attention to the Labour Party, particularly those of us who came from a Corbyn supporting section of said party, we soon got to know the most vicious and vociferous voices against a transformative government of change, cheerleading the call to return to red Toryism and having no problem whatsoever in propagating the anti-Semitism lie even. The claim that it was all Corbyn's fault, despite it being a societal ill, Focus placed on it being in the Labour Party, despite its existence elsewhere as well, all helpfully enabled by mainstream media, utterly wedded to establishment interests and not ours, in order to help that agenda along. And one such individual who became synonymous with this push was then former, now sadly again current, Labour NEC member Luke Akehurst, a guy who, despite repeatedly failing to get back on the NEC under Corbyn, mysteriously came top of the polls all of a sudden under Starmer, made all the more mysterious when even his own local constituency party in Oxford apparently wouldn't back him for the job. You can't help but wonder whether Starmer in his Zionist without qualification attitude helped things along for Akehurst in some way, or those with an agenda along those lines thereof did. Obviously this is just my own musings on the subject, but given Akehurst is director of Israel promotion body We Believe in Israel, which is funded by BICOM, the British Israel Communications and Research Centre, which is itself funded rather opaquely via private donations and has strong links to the Israeli state, which, given its treatment of Palestinians, is an apartheid state. Akers is not Jewish, but he is a Zionist, and he has been a key player in the attacks on the Labour Party under Corbyn over anti-Semitism. He works to promote Israeli interests, and he sits at Labour's top table once again now. 
But a piece of video footage came out and rapidly spread around social media yesterday of Akers making what some are calling inappropriate and others have referred to as anti-Semitic, misogynistic and even white supremacist in its nature. This is what he said. See what you think. Jackie has mixed antecedents, so Jewish on one side and Caribbean on the other side. And I can only interpret her remarks as playing out an inner conflict where she kind of feels very uncomfortable about the two parts of her heritage rather than celebrating both of them. This is in reference to Jackie Walker, a black Jewish woman, left-wing activist, writer and presenter on Redline TV, as well as making weekly appearances on Sunday mornings on the Not The Andrew Marr Show, doing the news review, which I've had the privilege of doing with her a couple of times myself. The lady is an absolute diamond, and Akers is talking out of his proverbials in, by the Labour rights own factional standards, in my view, in what is frankly racist. Jackie herself has responded to this, so let's start with that. She answered his tweet with, Luke Akers, at least try and get my heritage right. I have a Russian Jewish father and a mother of Jewish ancestry. As you know, I'm married to a Jewish man. Our politics and understanding of Zionism as being a deeply racist and barbaric ideology is totally shared. You know this, you know him. Does Graham Bash have an inner conflict about his identity? If not, what the F are you suggesting about people of mixed heritage? Jackie's husband, Graham Bash, happens to be white. But she said the Z word. And that elicited a response from the man who is, in effect, paid to defend it. Akers came back with, I'm very sorry for you if you cannot see Zionism as a beautiful ideology of anti-racism and the national liberation and culture flourishing of the Jewish people. I have no idea why you or anyone else harbors such intense negativity towards such a profoundly decent movement. That is enough to make you want to spew. No mention of what that ideology is doing to Palestinians, such as the segregation, the abuse, the land theft, the homes being forcibly demolished, the kids getting shot. Akers calls that beautiful, apparently. I remind you, this is a guy who has overwhelmingly too much clout at the very top of the Labour Party. Jackie came back on this, though. Your obsessive interference in the decades-long internal dispute between Jews on the matter of Zionism and your fascination in weapons of destruction is, I presume, based on some kind of dissatisfaction with the self, most likely a response to having experienced repeated childhood bullying, perhaps of being beaten by those in authority, or a sense of being unloved. Whatever the cause, it remains inexcusable to allow this emotional damage to be acted out in the public forum. Now, that's certainly a provocative statement. You can't blame her, given the insults she's been on the receiving end of. For reference, Akers is also extremely pro-nuclear weapons, hence his nickname, Luke the Nuke. Um, now, throughout this discourse, you have to appreciate that Akers shares neither ethnicity or culture with Walker or religion or with Judaism on the whole. Or is, so is opining on such matters you can only come across as extremely unwelcome to people with those backgrounds, especially to people who do share ethnicity with Walker, for example. According to Akers, she cannot overcome an inner conflict of her cultural and ethnic backgrounds, despite insulting, not even getting that right, uh, insultingly not even getting that right, as Walker correcting, but equally, this is something that can only be aimed at people who are black and Jewish, since the inner conflict, as Akers put it, could not be something a white Jew, by his own wording, by his own inference and meaning, could possibly have. Therefore, not only is this a distinctly anti-black sentiment, but also anti-Semitic, as by his words, black Jews can have issues that white Jews can't. Also, the claim that Akers feels Walker can't overcome an inner conflict between her two backgrounds is very much in self-hating Jew territory. Others felt that this is something aimed at Walker because she's a woman. And that's why the example of bringing up her husband went unacknowledged by Akers in his response to her. Misogyny, in which case, surely. What we have here is a commentary of a white non-Jewish man against a black Jewish woman that clearly, in my view, is racist, misogynistic. And given the derogatory nature of the comments against Jackie Walker's black heritage, white supremacist in nature as well. Certainly, people have been purged from the party one hell of a lot less than this. And this is on film. If Labour has truly dealt with its racism problem and is doing so meaningfully, it will address this situation. Certain, as I feel sure this will be reported to the party, given how distressing it will be to some who watch it. If they ignore it, it's just further proof of what we already know, that the issue of anti-Semitism has been weaponized against the left. And Starmer's Labour genuinely do not give a stuff about it.
Atheist exemplifies everything that is wrong with a right-wing-led Labour Party. Then in government, we'll see men like Akers with even more influence than they've got now. Surely to God we deserve better than a governing party that welcomes and elevates people like this, especially when so many of us who are vehemently opposed to such disgusting narratives have been made to feel significantly unwelcome by that same party in turn. Does that surely not make for a more racist party and not a less racist one? What do you think of Akers' comments? How do you interpret what he said? Do you agree with him or disagree with him and why? And what of Jackie Walker? She's been vilified by far more people than just Akers over the years. Clearly she pushes buttons. Is she entirely right to do so, though, in her defence of her ethnicity and her cultural background? Check out Redline TV and not the Andrew Marshall as well to see more of her in action if you're not particularly familiar with what she does and says now. Do have your say in the comments below as well and be part of the conversation on this. Is it time Labour told Akehurst to sling his hook and how can they justify not doing so after all of this? Thanks for watching. Hope you found the video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did more content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation. We're back in January. Starmer's Labour actually expelled a living Holocaust survivor purging Jewish people. Not exactly news, of course, but this story was particularly rancid, and in light of Akers being in a position to purge such people himself, being on the NEC, yet not be purged, and likely will go completely unpunished over his conduct here, well, if you think Labour isn't more racist than it ever was previously, and of course there's no denying that, then I have a bridge to sell you. I'll hopefully see you on the next bid, though. Cheers, folks. Right, so some good news for a change, folks. I know it does happen rarely, but it does happen occasionally. Rishi Sunak's gang of polluting pains in our butts got handed their own backsides in the Lords twice over last night, all thanks to the leads taken by Green Party peer Jenny Jones. Now, regular viewers will know that I did a video recently where Rishi Sunak and Michael Gove swanned off to Norfolk in high-vis jackets by helicopter, no less, because Sunak loves to blow our money so as not to travel the same way as the rest of us do, or to launch an amendment to Gove's levelling up bill, which sought to use those new Brexit freedoms we won to freely allow developers to no longer have to clean up their own messes when they happen to spill them into our waterways. It's not enough that they're allowed with the private water companies to pollute them already with prolific proportions of poop, but they wanted to excuse developers joining in by bidding off EU nutrient neutrality legislation, meaning for however much mess they made building houses near rivers that happen to spill in, that none of us can afford to buy anyway, we'll be picking up the town for cleaning up that via the public purse. Naturally, the talking turnip that is the Environment Secretary Tree's coffee was in on all of this as well. They make the mess. We have to clean it up. Hardly fair and, of course, hardly environmentally friendly. Now, we've been here before in the Lords, of course. The Greens bringing forward legislation to block something awful the Tories are doing. But Green peers are thin on the ground there. To get their way, they have to convince other parties to join in with them. When this was done a while back regarding another Jenny Jones-led motion, a rare fatal motion as that was in order to block Suella Bradman giving the police powers to block any demonstration they vaguely determined to be more than minor, it fell because Labour on that occasion didn't see its job as the official opposition to oppose what they saw as convention and tradition, despite that very same convention and tradition trampling all over and harming our freedoms. The opaque, out of touch and archaic rules of the honourable members of the Houses of Parliament come before basic things like our rights and the law of the land being fair, it would seem. Democracy died a death on that day and Keir Starmer whipped them all to do it. On this occasion, however, Labour have done the right thing. In this instance, Labour were clearly saying beforehand they opposed the binning of former EU legislation on this nutrient neutrality. So it seems being an opposition all hinges on whether they choose to oppose the Tories or not on any given day, whether it happens to be the right thing or not. Well, we'll take the win on this occasion. But ultimately, this only came up in the Lords, this meaningful opposition, this doing something about the Tory plans to dirty up our waterways yet more by being led by a Green peer, not the collective number of Labour peers. It's not being very well reported in the media, I've noticed today, though, either. Uh, one of the only mainstream papers covering it is The Guardian, who are making a big thing out of Labour defeating the government and Jenny Jones helping to lead the rebellion. But then, for a paper that peddled anti-Semitism, Corbyn's stories harder than any other, you can't really expect much. Anyway, 
with the Tories wanting to relax rules on pollution connected with house building, the showdown was set. And with Labour and the Lib Dems joining the Green-led charge against it, the government attempted to ram this change through. And it got beaten, got defeated by 203 votes to 156. So pretty emphatic stuff. Now, you might be thinking, but Damo, this has happened in the House of Lords. It'll just go back to the House of Commons, get voted through there again with some tweaks and changes or whatever, and it'll be back in the Lords where some might not be too interested in fighting this any further. It's what we've seen happen again and again and again with other bits of legislation, isn't it? What the government wants ran through, eventually they will get their way come hell or high water. And yeah, that does seem to happen a lot. It does make you wonder how useful as a second check the House of Lords can be at times. But that isn't the case here. The Tories trying to relax these rules on nutrient neutrality are completely dead now. Why? Well, they tried to slide them into the bill at a late stage in the proceedings. There are various stages all bills have to go through before they end up becoming law. And they've tried to slide this through at third reading in the House of Lords. And that means there's no more space in the progress of this bill for it to return to the House of Commons because third reading of this bill happened there all the way back in last December. So the only stages left of this bill's progressing are the consideration of amendments at final stage, which have to be agreed by both houses, and the Lords are not going to back down on something they've just defeated. And after that, it's just royal assent. And that amounts to just signing what has been laid down and passed by both houses into law. Neither are stages of dramatic last minute change. And if they were, that would be challenged as rather undemocratic because both houses would be denied a say in that. So short of the Tories bringing this whole nutrient neutrality issue back as a bill in and of itself and starting this whole process again, bearing in mind all this started getting on for 18 months ago, this bill being presented and beginning its progress, you soon realise there isn't time in this parliamentary calendar really, realistically, to do that. As Jenny Jones has said, if this government really wants to do this, they can bring it all back again in a separate bill, start the whole process all over again, just on this as part of the King's speech. And that's coming on the 7th of November. Now, I can't imagine it's going to be a busy legislative period from the King's speech onwards in the run up to an election that could come within just a few months. And at the latest, in all likelihood, only around a year from then. So who knows? They may try to rush it through. They're not happy at all with Labour. Sunak has sneered at Starmer as being a blocker and not a builder. But with his new nickname of Inaction Man, Tory weasel words on developer pollution having a negligible impact on the pollution there anyway, smacks of an attitude of, oh, well, it's full of shit now already anyway. No one will notice a bit more. And so Starmer's new nickname for him has every chance of sticking. And you know how much it galls me to ever give him props for anything. It's a solid win for the Green Party. Amazing how effective they've proven to be in recent months in the Lords, considering there are literally only two of them. You don't need many elected Greens, evidently, to make a big bloody difference then, eh? The media are giving Starmer's lot the credit, not entirely undeserved in this instance, but let's not pretend they instigated this. They just did the right thing this time, whilst others did the leading. Next time, like last time, that might not be the case. Please do leave a comment and let me know your feelings on this defeat, though. Do you reckon Sunak, Gove and Coffee will try and bring this back again yet in a new bill? Do you think there's still time to do that in this parliamentary period? Have your say and join in the conversation. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. New content out daily. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation on that fatal motion defeat from earlier this year. Another reason why the Green Party and a Green vote is the progressive one these days. As establishment parties of all colours repeatedly end up failing us at some point. And I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so there's generally no shortage of reasons to want to take Keir Starmer by the scruff, for example, try to shake him, shake the stupid out of him. Sadly, there's too much, we find, that he's clogged up with the stuff. And no matter how much you might want to rid him of some of his senselessness, he seems to be positively constipated with it. I think it's why his face looks so puffy these days. But he's come out with some policy, my goodness, on migration, no less, and has managed to tee up the Tories beautifully to attack him, whilst simultaneously managing to give the left yet more reasons to despise him as well. It truly is a talent to be in a position where you want to be elected and yet seem to be winding up more and more of the electorate than you're attracting. It's quite the talent. At least we now know he's good at something, though. So what is he on about then, Damon? Well, it's the small boats crossings, the crisis of people risking their lives to try and get to this country to claim asylum. First and foremost, though, however you feel about these people coming here via small boats from we know not what until they claim asylum, can we agree that none of us want them to die in the attempt, though? 
If you're the sort that doesn't care about that or thinks they deserve to perish at sea, frankly, just stop watching this video and leave now. Never darken my door or my channel again. Go find a Reform UK supporter or some such to watch. They'll be much more to your liking. GB News, maybe. I've no time for people who, to my mind, are frankly less than human myself commenting on this with attitudes like that. Alternatively, you might have seen the title and wondered what the Mad Cornishman is on. Just open asylum routes, let the whole world come here, ignore the smuggling gangs, what nonsense is this? But bear with me, I've not lost the plot, I believe the gangs do need to be beaten, and I think we should take a fair share of asylum seekers. I just think Starmer, much like the Tories, has no grasp whatsoever on how to actually achieve this. I will start with the one thing Starmer has got right though on this, in my opinion, rare, faint praise for recognising the painfully obvious, as it is, frankly, because we do need a returns policy back in place. And Labour announced that under them this would happen. The obvious caveat here is, I'm assuming, Starmer will keep his word on this. So, significant caveat there. But he ought to, and is probably likely to, because the lack of an EU returns policy is a significant part of the Tories' problems with migration right now, and one they flat refuse to address in any meaningful way. I've mentioned it in other videos, so I won't dwell on it again here, but this returns policy problem comes from Boris Johnson's Brexit deal, which failed to acknowledge the need for one, which basically allowed us to share the burden of housing people who come here to seek asylum with other countries in the EU. Before we left the EU, we had this arrangement. We took a fair proportion, a fair share, and afterwards we didn't. So now all asylum seekers coming here now have to be housed here. Instead of negotiating a new returns policy with the EU, the Tories instead felt deportations to Rwanda were a better idea, not for asylum seekers, given it is not a safe third country, with a temporary layover on a Legionella-riddled prison barge if they're particularly unlucky. But it looks better for the Tories with regards to their base, because any sign of doing deals with the EU will send the Brexiteers out paying for their blood. In fact, this omission by Johnson is a leading reason as to why we've seen an increase in asylum attempts here, because risking your life to cross the channel right now means you have to be housed here, as things stand. Rwanda is likely to be ruled illegal. Many asylum seekers will know this and are hedging their bets. A returns policy not guaranteeing them housing in the UK would make some of them think twice as to whether that trip across the channel is worth risking their lives for. So... Tory immigration policy is not only incompetent, but blatantly in their party's interests and not those of the people affected, certainly not for us as a country. So Labour are, at least on the face of it, not playing to Tory voters on this particular aspect of this issue with negotiating a returns policy. But caveats fell out, like I said. If they look like they're losing votes over it, don't imagine the red Tories won't switch and bin it off, saying, um, put themselves first any more than the blue ones already do. So it's yes to a returns policy at this moment in time. That'll bin off Rwanda. No complaints from me here about that. But it's the obviously necessary first move. Yet even this, Starmer screwed up. He couldn't just leave it at a returns policy in his announcements. Because targets under said returns policy are something to be negotiated with the EU should the time come. Putting a number on it now, well, that's not something you can really do. Yet Starmer has also said that in exchange for such a deal, there will need to be migrant quotas. And this tells me he doesn't understand what a returns policy with the EU means. It will, by its very nature, restrict numbers allowed to stay here, and as proven by the lack of one now, will reduce the number of crossings. But equally, we have to give the EU an incentive to agree to a returns policy with us again. What is in it for them? You don't get to impose a target on the EU of how many you'll take, given they will be taking a chunk of those coming here. Though equally, Starmer has stupidly given the Tories another attack line because of this, because they're now saying, Starmer will let 100,000 migrants a year come here, or 120,000 a year come here. And they won't stop there, because any notion of dealing with the EU will come with accusations that he's going to take us back into the single market and back into the customs union. And while I have no problem with that, I can clearly see the damage the Tories' version of Brexit has done, Mr. Undo Brexit, as he once was, has gone to great pains to distance himself from such notions. Dishonest as Starmer is. Many hopeful Europhiles are hoping he's been lying this whole time will undo Brexit totally when he gets into power. But if you have to lie about your intentions rather than making the case for them, then you're not really a leader, are you? You're a con man. And people who feel conned will abandon you quick smart because they can't trust you. What's the figure you have in mind for these quotas then, though, Keith? And what are you going to offer the EU to agree to this? We don't need to undo Brexit to have 
such an agreement with them, incidentally. But there has to be something in it for the EU regardless. Obviously, there must be something. You're now under pressure by Tory attack lines to announce what it is. And they're going to keep battering you over this until you say what it is. It's all your own fault you put yourself in this position, and I'm sure the EU would be fascinated to hear it too. Because if the figure isn't realistic and fair, if the deal isn't sweet enough, they can scoff and tell you to stuff it. In fact, some EU diplomats have apparently already dismissed Starmer's wishlist strategy as delusional. We have no leverage over this, thanks to the Tories. The EU are under no pressure to accept unrealistic targets at all. That isn't something Starmer can be blamed for, of course. But he'll look every bit of his, the out-of-depth idiot so many of us know him to be if he says a stupid figure on this now. The elephant in the room over all of this, though, is Starmer's defiant rhetoric to treat the small boat people, the people traffickers, that is, like terrorists. So how are you going to do that, then? You have to catch them, have to stop them. The Tories have spent millions trying to trying and failing to stop them. And more boats keep crossing, more people keep drowning as a result. No, I appreciate the Tories care nothing for lives lost at sea. Demands that the RNLI stop rescuing them. Demands that the Navy turn them around in the Channel will not soon be forgotten. Is this what all this British steel for British warships is all about then, Keith, that you were crowing about earlier in the week? The steel is Chinese calling itself British steel, by the way, and they don't make steel plate for ships at all, but that's another video. But to tackle terrorism on the high seas, is this what they're for? How dare they drop all these people here? How dare they send them to their deaths? How dare they bleed them of their every worldly possession? Now, I agree with all of that. How dare they? But the only way you're ever going to stop people trafficking across the Channel is to put them out of business, not by launching some kind of anti-terrorist and military action against them, or at least spinning the rhetoric of that about, because the Tories have tried and failed that repeatedly. Unless Starmer wants to demonstrate he's just as big a flop on this issue as they are, he's not going to want to repeat everything the Tories have tried and failed to do here. Yet that seems to be exactly what he's saying. Aside from that, the minute boats appear with the language of terrorism being used against them, people will start seeing them and automatically start linking asylum seekers to terrorists, not just the traffickers. Anybody coming over in that boat, they're going to start thinking, oh, my God, terrorism. God knows the Tories will certainly spin it that line if it suits them too, and I'm sure they would. Why is it the case for a safe legal asylum route cannot be made by Starmer? Why is he not doing it? The Tories have for years now claimed we have them when we don't. Starmer has never called them out on it that I can remember, and I can only surmise he and his handlers have calculated there's no political capital out of exposing that lie, because it was Labour under Blair, after all, that did away with legal routes to claim asylum. The same people that are pulling Starmer's strings now. So no wonder such political thinking is off the table. But equally, it's why rotten lefties are pointing out the simple fact that without a safe legal route, people are going to continue to die. Their reasons for coming here are their own, their case for asylum is their own. Let them make it without risking their lives to do so and negotiate a returns policy with the EU so we end up only taking a fair share of them here to house anyway. Yet this is Starmer's conundrum. This is his problem. And this is something he's created all for himself. He will drive away those longed-for right-wing boats if he capitulates on a returns policy and opens up safe and legal asylum routes, having done so much damage to the left in his conduct for years and not least his dishonesty. Unless he signals a dramatic departure from Tory migration policy, he won't be winning any of those votes back either. If that's even a reasonable expectation anymore, given everything else he's done to attack the left. Fundamentally, he's ticking off the right and the left with his clumsy ineptitude. Therefore, asylum seekers and migration policy is probably as doomed to failure under Starmer's labour as it is under the Tories now. He's afraid to lead. He's afraid to make the case for something. We have a weakling prime minister now. We'll probably have a weakling prime minister again after the next election, no matter who ends up entering number 10. And what's more, he's saying if you don't agree with him on this issue, Starmer, if you don't agree with him, then you're being un-British. Well, you can shove half a dozen flags up your backside and call yourself the British Hedgehog for all I care, Keith. There's nothing patriotic about you, your plans, or whether or not we agree with them here. And I'd think long and hard before connecting your plans for any semblance of what counts as national pride. Because there's nothing to be proud of with what you've done with Labour. And there's certainly nothing to be proud of by carrying on with Tory policy that still leads to people drowning in the channel. But what do you think of all of this, though? Is Starmer on to something? Do you think he's misleading people as to what he'll really do? Or is he going to be just as big a failure on migration policy as the Tories are now? I just wish we'd 
get a government that would look at these people crossing as living, breathing fellow human beings and not numbers on a piece of paper, but have your say in the comments and be part of the conversation on this. Can you tell me your thoughts? Thanks for watching, though. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share, and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. If you'd like to support the channel or find me on other social media, check out the Linktree link. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation where the Tories' answer to the migration crisis is to become even more hard right with their joke of a Deputy Chairman 30B, Lee Anderson, having recently made a tirade that could have easily come from Enoch Powell. I'll hopefully see you on the next vid. Cheers, folks.